Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 460. I'm checking three. It's 460. I can't believe we've done 463 of these. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and it's checking. It's the 13th of December, much too close to Christmas, well into Advent. Uh, and it's the feast of St. Lucy, who was an early Christian martyr who decided her love for Jesus was worth giving up her life for. Okay, welcome to the program. Um, I have Gavin, who is a resident of England. He doesn't belong to the Church of England. He left many uh, many years, a year or two ago. Yeah, oh, I think <laughs> it seems like a long time. It does. A whole lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like a long time ago. And we have Gavin on because the Church of England likes to do crazy things. And today, Gavin and I are going to talk about the new liturgy uh, for transgender baptisms. And uh, we're going to talk about many different aspects of this. Uh, but before we do that, I wanted to read uh, a, a viewer email uh that was sent to me this week right after the news broke and uh let me check this out oh hi kevin i've been watching the anglican videos you george and gavin post for several years i'm new from classical pentecostal pastor to an anglican priest under bishop uh, bleep i'm not going to i don't want to identify this guy here in bleep america uh, i just saw the headlines about transgender celebration stuff from the church of england in all of your reporting you guys are giving from around the communion, is there no voice inside the Church of England? Is there no John the Baptist? Is there no one to, to reverse course and say stop? And I thought, you know, Gavin, this is important because um, there we've discussed this time and time again. There's a lot of people that say, I'm going to leave the Church of England when they cross a red line, oh, a, yes, a red line yes. in the sand. There's people that say, I'm going to leave the Church of England when there's a good, viable other option, a GAFCON, um, GAFCON UK or whatever. And then there's people who say, I'm in it forever. And there's people like you who've left already. And I think we have these four stages of people, and they all complain that there's nobody left inside the Church of England who's going to say stop. <clears throat> and, and if they do say stop, they're start, certainly not making the press. Um, Who's saying stop over this, Gavin? Well, there are a few, uh, and they, they deserve credit. I, I think I want to start off by giving credit to Andrew Symes of Anglican Mainstream uh, and, and recommend that people look at Anglican Mainstream's posts. Andrew's written a couple of excellent articles on the, on, on the notion of transgenderism. Uh, Dr. Ian Paul, who sits on the Archbishop's Council, uh, Ian takes a more liberal stance than me of almost everything, but on this occasion he's written a first-class article uh, holding the bishops up to a certain amount of, of ridicule. Adrian Hilton, who's known as Archbishop Cranmer, with his got a, a very influential blog, um, he's written a hysterical article today saying that he he expects he's a he's a member of the Conservative Party and um, was a would-be Conservative MP once, and today he's written an article saying that in the majority socialist church of england he wants a baptismal liturgy for people who are coming out as, as conservatives <laughs> well, now in fairness <laughs> i've often joked that i was baptized a capitalist christian so uh maybe we just need to open up this liturgy uh to include everybody who wants to add a title to their baptism well you're, you're jumping in the, the deep end of the theology which is uh how we describe ourselves as christian what adjectives adjectives we put in front of them and why it is only in our culture and for the Church of England, why it is only sex and gender identity that the Church of England not choosing to preference? Well, we know the answer to that, but that's the $64,000 question for this issue. I don't, it, for people at their computers right now, I want you to go to Google or whatever your favorite search engine is and type duck 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 is good <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and, and type detransitioning one word together and you're gonna uh, have all these blogs and all these uh, uh websites and a lot of videos come up of people who regret transitioning who were going through the process taking the hormones some had sur many had surgery and are now to the point where Nobody told me that transitioning would not make me feel better 
about my body. A my lot mind. of people, and my mind. mind. I mean, a lot of people, many people transitioning right now are having body complex issues where they're not happy with their body. And they think the solution is to transition to another gender. And uh, I, I go through and I just watch with tears um, these testimonies of people who said, my doctor never told me I wouldn't feel better. I thought, you know, becoming, going from male to female would make me feel better about my body. It didn't work. And so I'm on more antidepressants and my body's been mangled and um, it, it's so hard to watch these. It's even more hard to watch the mother church adopt this into a baptism, adopt this into something that we are going to say is okay. And your image is in Christ Church of England, not in your body. Uh, I, it, stuff like this makes me so angry. Uh, as you can tell, hold it back. Um, there's responses, but this isn't going to slow down in the Church of England. They've really swallowed the pill, and uh, everything we said. Here's how I see it. Ten years ago, we would go to the Church of England and say, hey, are you guys noticing what the Episcopal Church is doing? Have you seen what... Uh, the Anglican Church in Canada is doing, you need to stop this. And Rowan Williams and the leadership at the time, we're looking into it, we're going to do something, we're going to form maybe a panel or reference or something. Over time, especially now under Justin Welby, we no longer go to the Church of England because they're leading the charge into liberalism. They're leading the charge into this transitioning baptism. Does it exist in Canada yet? It, everything's changed. The speed of change is really very alarming indeed. The context, of course, is that the in General Synod last summer authorized the bishops to find some pastoral way of affirming people who were transitioning their gender. Um, at one level, of course, it's very important that, that anybody who is in a position of being confused or wounded or having difficulties of being a Christian should be offered whatever support that can be done. But this issue of gender identity has dominated the Church of England's self-understanding. And we need to put this in context, of course. Why is it that sex and gender identity has become so important? The first thing to say is that, that it, it seems to treat God like a giant therapist. The, the theology behind this is we present ourselves to God and what we're asking for is unconditional acceptance and a pat on the head and the blessing of who we've chosen to be. But of course, this isn't Christianity at all. Some people have described as morally therapeutic deism, which is a long way of saying, you know, God, God, the nice shrink, <laughs> who just, <laughs> who just wants us to feel better about ourselves. But that isn't. Jesus didn't come to make us feel better about ourselves. He came to save us from the hell, which is both inside and outside ourselves. So, why is the Church of England doing this? And the answer is, it, it's as you say, it swallowed the pill. But it's essentially cozying up to this very dangerous political movement that's changing our culture with incredible rapidity. So we, we know it began with, with feminism and then moved on to gay marriage and now transgenderism and um, we're worried it's going to spill over to pedophilia and polyamory and polygamy. But essentially it's an attack on the idea of gender and the Christian family. And we know that it comes out of a form of Marxism uh, as, as the West slips inexorably left politically. When you look at transgenderism in particular, it's astonishing that the church should be so naive because it brings with it two serious associations. Now, I'm very much about against guilt by association because that's what the left always do to the centre and the right. But, but if you notice that um, there are travelling companions to a movement, then you're entitled to ask questions about it. And the two travelling companions here are censorship and violence. So um, you, you're already aware, Kevin, and perhaps a number of listeners are, there's a, a man called James Caspian. James was a psychotherapist involved in transitioning, supporting people. And then he suddenly became aware of what you began the program with, of, of the fact that there's something called trans regret. And the people he'd given his professional life and help supportively to, uh, as he ushered them into this, this new way of being human, but of a different gender with hormones and, and, and surgery, that some people were profoundly regretting it. So in other words, he wasn't helping people, he was harming some people. 
he sat down to try and do some research because there were no figures. I mean, you produce anecdotal evidence. The web can only give us anecdotal evidence. There are no, there's no one giving us hard evidence because it's being censored. So he applied to a university to do a research degree. They accepted him. Then they discovered what he was doing and the implications. It's called Bath Spa University in England. And they fired him. They closed him down. Um, as well as the censorship, which he experienced there and we see within the media, there's violence. There's a terrifying degree of violence in this. It's experienced by feminists in London who've been beaten up by, by, by trans thugs uh, because feminists have been saying we fought so hard for women's rights as we understand them. We really don't accept that a man, born a man with XY chromosomes and male hormones and uh, a bit of surgery on his genitals can inhabit womanhood. Um, and we don't accept that. So the trans people have been furious and they've simply beaten them up. Uh, there's one poor woman who got assaulted at Speaker's Corner a year ago. There's a very well-known woman philosopher, academic. She's had people, and I'm sorry to be to be colourful here, but she's had people pissing on her office door, leaving death threats, defecating, because she's a feminist who says this trans thing doesn't produce the genuine goods at the other end of the process. Now, if a movement like this is involved with censorship and violence as part of its daily DNA, is it really beyond the bishops of the Church of England to stop and think for a moment that what they're doing is not acting on behalf of the great therapist in the sky, patting anyone with a bruise on the head saying, there, there, God loves you unconditionally, really, whatever you think you are, whatever you want to do. Might they not consider that not only did they have their theology wrong, but they got their politics and their culture wrong too. The answer is it doesn't seem to have occurred to them. And they're willing to change even baptismal liturgy, which is at the heart of defining what it is to be a penitent Christian ready to be transformed in order to continue this farce of God the Shrink who gives you unconditional affirmation. I, there's lots of things that turn up in our, our culture to justify this. God does not make mistakes uh, is a, uh, a call of the, the LGTBI, whatever uh, adjective uh, abbreviation they have now, uh, community, where their feelings are not a mistake. Uh, their desires are not a mistake. Uh, and it's being adopted here as well by the, the gender community. My feeling that I'm uh, body unhappy and that uh, I want to transition as to a male or to a female is the adoption of that. And Gavin and I fully agree this is a tough topic. Um, and we're dealing with psychological issues, we're dealing with uh, body image issues, and we're not being flippant about that. We're being flippant about the Church of England's response to this. Um, there, are two, there are two very serious theological mistakes that are being made. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and some people think the word theology is, is an esoteric word, but theology describes reality. It's, it, when used properly, it's a hard word that tells us what's really going on. The first is that, that contemporary Christianity seriously underestimates evil and the way in which creation is flawed. Uh, and the fact is that, that what, you know, there are people born without enough limbs. There are people who, who are born with, with birth defects. There are people who are born awfully well, but get led into terrible places. We live in this very confusing mixture of good and evil, so confusing that Jesus refused to act against evil when he was on earth by telling the disciples it was too complex as we transitioned from birth to death and that we'd have to wait until judgment for evil to be dealt with properly. But the other issue is this, this um, disnification of the mind where um, reality is whatever takes place in your mind. You can be whatever you want to be. It's just a matter of your imagination, your feelings being the mechanism that sets reality. Well, this is a piece of, of self-indulgent teenage narcissism. And, and, and anybody who aspires to grow up ought to have grown out of the mental illness that says, whatever is in my mind is how the world ought to be. But these two very serious category errors are what lie behind the situation that you described really 
quite poetically, which is, um, I can trust my feelings to be the reality that I build my life on and the culture around me on and, and change liturgy and Christian theology on, change the thrust of the Gospels on. It, it's, it's, it's not acceptable. Well, it goes to, to Hooker's three-legged stool real quick. You know, uh, in the culture of the Church of England, in the culture of the secular society, experience rules all. Okay, yeah. where we've thrown out scripture, we've thrown out uh, tradition, and we've thrown out reason. Okay, th those don't matter at all anymore. It's the experience um, uh, in our thoughts and our minds, and it, it's so hard to watch this happen. Because Kevin, we've been we've been reading through the Book of Revelation in in, uh, in the lection that we we use in the run up to Advent, uh, and I was very struck indeed by how how harsh Jesus is towards the early church and the early church that we tend to idolize sometimes but these these seven churches that, that John had a vision of and and he says um, you're really falling down in the way in which you accept people telling untruths you're falling down that some of you have fallen asleep you're falling down because you're not showing the right kind of agape and compassion you're falling down because uh, you you're not you're not awake uh, Jesus comes and then he says, I, I chastise those I love. We have, we have to, we have to have, don't have to do anything. We're invited yes. to repent. <laughs> we're invited. No, we're you invited have to, to repent. Don't worry. You got that right. <laughs> <laughs> no, we do have to repent. That's true. We have to repent. Uh, we, but, but, but to grow and to live as a Christian, we, at every stage, but especially in Advent and Lent, we're invited to spring clean and say, where am I going wrong? Where have I allowed my desires, my my stupidity, my short sightedness, my weak willedness to lead me astray? Um, it's it's astonishing that even in a liturgical church like the Church of England, where re reflection is built into the liturgical seasons, there isn't any sense that they connect with the way they're doing their public theology. In the end, in my mind, my humble mind, well well informed mind. The point of the liturgy is to glorify God. Am I right here, Bishop? Absolutely. Okay. Yes, it, it, it's liturgia. It's a service. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I see liturgies like transbaptism, I see a liturgy that glorifies man or humankind mm. or uh, our flawedness. And I don't see how we can theologically, I, I, according to one viewer, I'm not allowed to use theology, um, but how we can theologically uh, apply that here. We're, we're now glorifying uh, the broken condition, our sinful condition. Well, it, it, but because we're doing therapy instead of Christianity. Mm. And, and, you know, that's, that's the great error. You re okay, I'm not going to rant. We shouldn't. <laughs> we, we've done enough <laughs> ranting in this. Uh, but here's a great time to transition to a new topic. <laughs> Oh, you've been waiting. Oh. I was waiting for that one. There it comes. You know, I got it's it, not I got bad it in for ten, Thursday. You I, know? I got it in 10 minutes ago, Kevin. You know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you stole my line. I did. But it's okay. That's okay. So let's transition. It was your, and, it was your and, idea. And, and, and talk two minutes on Brexit. Okay. Okay. Um, you English really know how to muck up something that should be really simple. <laughs> okay. In my observation. I know this because... I'm a colonist of England, and we muck things up 10 times easier than you do. Um, it, Theresa May uh, went up for a uh, do we trust you vote, and she passed that uh, yesterday. Uh, it looks like whatever condition of Brexit you have will con continue, but I don't understand if you guys are leaving or if you're going to let the European Union to Brexit. So okay. why is Brexit so difficult? Well, Kevin, the fact is we have on one side, we have the EU who want to administer a punishment beating to the UK to terrify anybody else from imagining they could leave and be independent. And then in the middle, you have the politicians the majority of whom would like to stay with the EU because they're corporate guys yeah. and, and ladies and, and people in between, who knows? And, uh, and then then there's the nation, which just has a majority for, for, for leaving. And um, the, the problem is we can't find a way of 
having a clear majority in parliament to do the will of the nation. So what's happening is they're, they're spinning the dice every so often and hoping that when the dice lands, circumstances will be slightly different to allow something to happen they haven't foreseen yet. Um, because at the moment, all the outcomes as people, as politicians plan them, leave us staying in the European Union. That no, is really quite frightening. It is. It, you guys, I, the European Union has like a Dennis Cannon. Yeah, once it does. You, once you <laughs> sign up, when, you when, can't get when, out. Yeah, once you sign up, you leave. We get your, we get your country. Uh, we get your politicians. We get your your income, your taxation. We, you know, there's just no way to leave us. Um, and uh, if you do leave, anybody in the European Union isn't going to deal with you. So you have no imports, no exports, and all that. And they they have this this uh, relationship based on fear. Kind of like there's the a, there's a fear very, the, there is a real danger emerging, which I mean, I I just hope it's not the case. But we've already seen civil unrest on the streets of France. Sure. Well, people have been laughing and saying the French do that kind of thing. But there's a large disease in English society where we realize that our democracy is not working. And if democracy isn't working, it, it's, a, it's a really quite a frightening thing. The, the, as anger gets ratcheted up and as we seem to find no way of working through it, People are talking of civil unrest and even civil war. Well, you Americans wouldn't know what a problem civil war could be. <laughs> but but it's, it's it's quite astonishing to me that, that people are starting to talk that way. Well, uh, they, and they, and they it will, doesn't seem a way through. Yeah, they will in France because France still has a 22% unemployment rate. The people on the streets have nothing better to do. And, and you know, that can lead to revolt that can lead to another you know mini french revolution stuff like that um here in america we don't have our big wall street protests like we had under the obama administration we don't have our big sit-ins and stuff like that because everybody's employed everybody's too busy with their jobs to to be overly involved in the politics we have our socialists we have our liberals and stuff like that but the economy is running just fine and the complainers are all working and they don't have time to take off and, and protest. And I think that's one of the things you have to really uh, cohesive understanding of the, the populace is what is the populace doing? You can have changes if they're all working and they don't have time to protest. But in France, that's, that's, a, that's a little different.